Welcome to an hour of HealthMade Radio. HealthMade is a community for natural health seekers where we educate people about common health conditions and share extensive research on the most effective natural health treatments and promote legislation that protects our health freedoms. A core concept belief is in the innate intelligence and healing power of the body, and if properly supported spiritually, emotionally, and nutritionally, it can find its way back to health. HealthMade Radio will bring information from integrative health experts throughout the world. Health is what you make it. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld, and I will be your host. Today's guest is Mark Woolin, Director of Family Constellation Institute in San Francisco. Mark is a world leader in the field of inherited family, family trauma. A best-selling author and sought-after lecturer, he teaches at hospitals, clinics, conferences, universities, and teaching centers around the world, including the University of Pittsburgh, JFK University, Western Psychiatric Institute, Kripalu, the New York Open Center, the Omega Institute, and the California Institute of Integral, uh, Integral Studies. His book, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle is the winner of 2016 Silver Nautilus Book Award in Psychology and has been translated into over 20 languages. Mark, it's, it's, it's so, I'm so excited to have you on the show because this is such a crucial subject to discuss and people aren't really aware of that this is something that's impacting their life. Oh, thank you for having me on the show, Dr. Michael. I'm glad to be here. So I'm... I've, yeah, you, know, you are a leader in the field of inherited family trauma. What 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 is that? I mean, if we could create kind of like a framework, what you know, what what is that? Let's say one of our parents or our grandparents had a significant trauma. They lost their mother or their father when they were young, or or even our mother or father. Um, they were sent away to an or placed in an orphanage or foster care or maybe one of their siblings died tragically when they were young. An event like this, it can break the heart of the family. And the reaction to the trauma doesn't necessarily stop with the people who experienced it. So the, the feelings and the sensations, specifically the stress response, the way the genes express, this can pass forward to our children and our grandchildren, affecting them in a similar way, even though they didn't personally experience the trauma that the parents and the grandparents went through. And, and now, as we know, there's substantial biological evidence that, that demonstrates these, these, these gene changes. That's just incredible. So if we have, let's say, my, my mother, I mean, she was dealing with, she was witnessing uh, my grandmother she was an alcoholic my grandmother and and she was kind of being abused by men and and so my mother seeing this you know obviously then has this carries this anger you know towards men and she was dealing then with psoriasis as a kind of physical manifestation so but this if if this is not corrected or handled, you know, this anger will then genetically be passed on to the next generations. Oh, absolutely. And also, if she's young enough and the, uh, you know, grandmother's pain is affecting her attunement with mom, then all of a sudden mom also has a break in the attachment, and that has its own uh, bowl of soup. <laughs> you know, it's uh, when we have a break in the attachment, with a parent, we find that the effects of that trauma uh, also pass forward and affecting the children similarly, which would have been my story and my family uh, as well. Uh, all the, the grandparents are orphaned in some way. So how, so what was it, I mean, there must be a reason for you to, I mean, was there a defining moment for you to, to really explore this field? Because this is, Obviously, this is not something that is well known, even though it is well recognized. You know, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of people talking about this in the world of psychology. So what, what drove you to, to this type of research and recognizing this? Well, well the answer is t 
two, twofold. You know, like many of us, I had symptoms I couldn't explain. About 30 years ago, I began to lose the vision in one of my eyes, and I was diagnosed with a chronic form of retinopathy. And the doctors uh, couldn't cure it, and because of the way it was progressing, they told me I'd likely lose the vision in my other eye as well. And I, I guess you can imagine I was pretty desperate to find help and went on a search for healing. Um, uh, it led me halfway around the globe, literally as far as Indonesia, where I learned from several wise teachers um, who taught me some fundamental principles, um, one of which was the importance of healing my relationship with my parents, which was pretty broken. But before I could do that, I had to heal what stood in the way, uh, inherited family trauma, though I didn't know it at the time, specifically the anxiety I had inherited from all of my grandparents who were orphaned when they were children. Three of them lost their mothers when they were babies and infants, and the fourth loses her father when she's a year old, which ultimately she'd lose her mother's attunement because the mother would be grieving. This anxiety, I would later learn, was the real cause of my vision loss. And, you know, I had inherited a feeling of being broken from a mother's love. That's the story in my family. And this would, would have been passed down. I remember being a small boy, maybe five or six years old, feeling panicked whenever my mother would leave the house. I'd, I'd go into her room, I'd cry into her scarves and nightgowns, thinking that I'd never see her again and that her smell would be the only thing I had left which would have been the truth for my grandparents who were orphans. And 40 years later, uh, I, I shared this with my mom, and she told me she had done the exact same thing when her mother left the house. And then my sister reading the book said, honey, I did the same thing when mom would leave the house. So this, this was sort of a family pattern of fearing every time the mother was out of the room that she was gone forever. And after healing a, a broken bond with my mom, my, my sight came back, which was a welcome surprise. And afterwards, I felt compelled to share these principles that I had learned and ultimately developed a method for healing the effects of inherited family trauma. It's just incredible to me that you, I mean, people don't recognize how strong a physiological effect a trauma like that can have. So, I mean, even something like being blind in one eye. I mean, that if you look upon that as something very physical, so it's hard to imagine that, that there's a, an emotional driver behind it, but then when you're healing it and your vision comes back, I mean, that's proof in the pudding. You know, many times we, as you're, as you're saying, we don't look at the emotional or spiritual uh, components. We're really looking for a physical treatment or a physical cure and often one doesn't exist until we pull back the curtains and look at the deeper elements to the story you know you asked me a question earlier what led me into inherited family trauma and it was one case dr michael that sort of opened this was 30 years ago it was a case that opened my eyes um to this idea that um, something deeper is going on here. I remember, do you mind if I tell the case? I think it's important. Please. Yes, I would love to. Okay. Um, about 30 years ago, I was working with a lot of cutters, self-injurers. Uh, I, too, had been a self-injurer back in the day, and all of a sudden now these self-injurers are coming my direction for healing. And I, um, anyway, get, getting back to this particular young woman, she was 24 years old. And I'll call her Sarah, though that's not her real name. And she cut in an extreme way. In fact, it was different than the other cutters who were cutting in a more superficial way. Um, Sarah would cut so deeply that she would hit a vein or an artery and almost bleed to death. And her parents would have to rush her to the hospital. And then she'd be placed in a psych ward for three or four weeks at a time. And my question at that time is, why... I'm working with many cutters. Why is Sarah cutting this deeply? Why, you know, what is it about the way she's cutting? What's she trying to be communicated here? And I was glad I was asking that question. So one day 
uh, Sarah was in my office and I gave her a pen and I said, Sarah, pretend this is your knife and put this knife to either one of the three places that you cut her arm, her abdomen or her thigh. And she put it to her arm and I started to see she was glazing, her eyes are glazing over, she's starting to dissociate. And I said, right there, Sarah, right there, what's that thought? What's that feeling? What's that impulse in your body? And she looks at me uh, half out of it and says, I, I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. And here I am, Dr. Michael, looking at a young woman. Her life has just begun. She's 24. And I said, what have you done? Did you accidentally cause a life, take a life? Did you cause an accident? Did you break up with somebody who took his life? She said, no, nothing like that. And so we looked in her childhood because I wanted to see what her relationship with her parents is like. And Dr. Michael, it was beautiful. She, she had these great parents who were supportive and loving and, you know, they're taking her to the hospital. They're deeply concerned. Um, she's able to receive their care receive their love, receive their nurturance. So I'm figuring, well, it still has to be in her attachment. So I started to look at the early events with her mother, and they weren't there. She has a safe, strong, secure attachment with her mom. And I was flummoxed. I said, uh, tell me about your grandparents. I was, luckily I said that, and boom, she drops the bomb. Her grandmother was an alcoholic and she was driving the car drunk and her grandpa was in the driver's seat and boom she crashes into a telephone pole grandma lives but grandpa goes through the glass through the windshield and gets cut lacerated on the glass and bleeds to death before the ambulance arrives and in that moment the whole story was being told in sarah's cutting when she cuts so deeply that she almost bleeds to death, well, that's communicating what happened to grandpa. When she feels as though she doesn't deserve to live, well, that's grandma's feelings. Um, what, what a powerful story. I mean, it, it's uh, like you're saying, she's playing out the, the, the two roles, but she is exactly it, it, the grandmother that is saying, I did this to my husband, the love of my life, and I need to go through what he went through. I should have done it. I want to take that away from him, and I want to carry that burden instead of him. The, the, exactly. The grandmother saying, what I've done for taking a life, the life of my beloved, just as you named it, um, I don't deserve to live for what I've done. So that's where that language, and in my book I talk a lot about trauma language. Um, maybe we can talk about that later, but her trauma language, her verbal trauma language, is I don't deserve to live. Her nonverbal trauma language is cutting so deeply and almost bleeding to death like the grandfather. So here's what I did with her because I was also a student of psychodrama during this time. As a student of psychodrama during this time, during this time I put two chairs out in the middle of the office and I said to her, um, Look at the two chairs and visualize. I'm sorry, someone's trying to call in, so it's causing a. Uh, um, okay, good. The call has now stopped. <laughs> so I have her looking at the two chairs, and I have her visualizing that her grandfather's in the chair to the right. And I say, Tell your grandfather, Sarah, tell him what you told me. Tell him how deeply you cut. And she said, Grandpa, I, and he's, you know, he's been long gone. In fact, she's never met this guy. He's been dead since when the, the age the father was when the father was 12. These were his parents. And she says, Grandpa, I cut so deeply, I hit a vessel, and I almost bleed to death. And I have her say, like you, Grandfather, like you bled to death. And at this point, she's crying, and she visual. I said, how's he responding to that? And she said, oh, he's telling me he doesn't want me to do this. And that when I go to cut, to visualize him there supporting me, with me, and he'll protect me, which is a powerful image. And I said, ah, okay, all right, so 
turn to the other chair and tell your grandmother what you told me, that I don't deserve to live. Tell her, Grandma, I have the feeling that I don't deserve to live. Tell her that that would be her feeling, that she felt she didn't deserve to live. And she says that. And then she visualizes the grandmother saying the same thing, that, you know, visual, the grandmother was long dead as well. She'd never met a grandmother. But she's visualizing these two people now with her when she goes to have the impulse to cut, externalizing what had been internalized, and she never cuts again. It was done. And for, you know, she needed to know that this feeling of needing to die wasn't hers and that, that she could do something about this. And it was profound. Um, actually, I didn't stop there. I had her bring her father in because I could see that the grief was held up in her, father, in her father's anger toward his mother for taking his father's life and at his father's anger for his mother being an alcoholic. And I did something similar with his father. I visualized his par- had him visualize his parents were out there, and I asked him a sentence. I said, tell me what happened to your grandmother, I mean to your mother, that made her drink. And he said, oh, when she was three, she was given away to an orphanage. And I looked at the father, and I said, of course she drank. She was missing the dopamine that her mother provided. She was missing the love, the care, the attunement, uh, neurologically the dopamine that would have been needed to a mother from a mother who would give her child away. And at that moment, the father began to have compassion for his mother. He was able to see that she wasn't the bad guy who killed his father, but a little baby who was missing her mother's care. And he was able to grieve this loss instead of it being stuck on anger at his mother. He was able to grieve the loss of his mother and his father. And it sort of disentangled the whole story from the emotions that keep us caught. It it was quite profound. And what was so beautiful is after we did this work, he stood up in the session, standing, um, facing Sarah, who was on the sidelines, and saying, you know what? You can leave this with me. I've got this. And Sarah oh. never cut again. How oh, cool. Oh, oh, that is powerful. That's extremely powerful. I mean, and, and it really speaks highly that, you know, we all think that our emotions and our acts and doings are things in isolation, that they are just there by themselves. But to recognize how all of this is connected within a, a network of individuals and actions and, you know, through the whole uh, genealogy, you know, that, that this is something that, that we are impacted by and our thoughts and actions are not just ours alone. They, they're driven by uh, activities that's been beyond who we truly are. Very well said. Very well said, Dr. Michael. You know, that's, I, I want to underscore what you just said. Our behaviors, our thoughts, our fears, often our feelings that we think started with us, didn't start with us in many, in, in, many, in many cases. These are merely um, a continuation of traumas that began in generations prior. Well, thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Mark Wollen. He is the best-selling author. His book is It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlfeld. I'm here with Mark Wolin. He is the uh, world-leading expert in the field of inherited family family trauma. Uh, So I'm curious, if we look then at at events in the world, you know, we have these kind of horrendous events that's taking place, like people, we we have the Holocaust survivors, we have, you know, uh, genocides that are taking place, you know, like in Rwanda, genocides has taken place in these areas. So can can these events uh, impact generations 
several generations after and people not really understanding what's going on, but it's actually then they have then been all genetically altered in a way because of the trauma that's taken place in that event. I, I love the way you said it, uh, genetically altered. It's true. Memories of trauma are imprinted in our parents and our grandparents' sperm cells and egg cells. And then this information passes forward to us, and, and then we can be born with altered brains that are preparing us biologically to cope with the traumas uh, that are similar to the ones that they experienced. And, you know, the question is, why is this? Why is that happening? And, you know, we need to look at the science. W when a trauma happens, it changes us. Literally, it causes a chemical change in our DNA. And this can change how our genes function, sometimes for generations. So technically, there's a tragic event or a, you know, a, a great loss, and a chemical tag will attach to our DNA and tell our cells to use or ignore certain genes, enabling us to better deal with this trauma that just happened. And then the way our genes are affected uh, changes how we act or feel or behave. Uh, for example, we can become uh, uh, sensitive or reactive to situations that are similar to the original trauma, even if that original trauma occurred in a past generation, so that we have a better chance of surviving it in this generation. I'll give you an example. If our grandparents came from a war-torn country, let's use Germany on either side, you know, either they experienced the bombings where practically a million people, many women and children and old people um, are killed uh, as factories and cities are exploding. Or on the other side, let's look at the Holocaust where people are being shot and uniformed men are lining people up in the square and taking people away. So there's either bombs going off uh, to the Germans or Jews being taken away, shot, gas killed. On either side, the Germans and the Jews could, and the Gypsies, and, you know, I want to keep going, many people were affected, could develop a sk skill set and then pass forward this skill set. And let's say this skill set uh, has inside it sharper reflexes, quicker reaction times, reactions to the violence to help the survivors survive the trauma. The problem is, we can also inherit the stress response with the dials set to 10, preparing us for a catastrophe that never arrives because we're born uh, a generation later in the suburbs. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, but here we are activated with um, a fight, flight, freeze response or hyperarousal or a hypoarousal. And all of a sudden, we're walking around with a shutdown a depression, an anxiety, um, a hypervigilance that's connected to our parents and grandparents, but we don't make the link, Dr. Michael. We just think we're wired this way. So how, how would an individual then be able to, to recognize, so let's say an individual is, is dealing with uh, anxiety or that they feel like you know, nobody loves them or... Uh, whatever emotion that they don't deserve and, and it's probably not coming from, from them, I mean, how, how would they be able to track down where these events are, are coming from if it is generational? I love your question. I love that question. Because there are, what I've discovered, there's signs. Uh, now, look, yes, it's true. We can be born with an altered brain and be born with an anxiety or a depression and never separate it from the events of the previous generation. That's true. But we can also experience quite often a fear or a symptom that strikes uh, suddenly or unexpectedly, say, when we reach a certain age or we hit a certain milestone or an event in our lives. For example, we reach the age 30, and that's the age our grandmother became a widow, and that's around the age our parents divorced, and all of a sudden at 30, we look at our partner and we go, huh, I'm just not feeling it. 
this person just doesn't do it for me anymore. And we've never connected it to the events of the previous generation. But also, there are triggering events, like, uh, for example, as soon as we get married, that can be a triggering event. Um, in the book, I talk about this woman. She loves her fiancé. She thinks her fiancé is the greatest guy in the world. But then as soon as she marries him, she feels trapped and she's depressed. And uh, she doesn't understand it because she says, I don't get it. I love this guy. But as soon as I married him, I'm miserable. And when we looked in her family history, we saw that both grandmothers had been given away at, as child brides at nine years old and 12 years old back in Iraq to much older men. And what was so cool is the trauma expressed differently in both of her sisters. There were three of them. She feels trapped like her grandmothers. The one sister marries a guy 30 years older like her grandmothers. And the other sister refused to get in a relationship at all because she didn't, you know, I don't want to be miserable. So it, um, <laughs> So that was the trigger, getting married. Another trigger can be we move to a new uh, home, a new city, a new country, or, or r even right around the block, and suddenly we become depressed like our ancestors that were persecuted or forced out of their homeland. I one time worked with this guy. I talk about him in the book. He, 74 members of his family were moved out of their home to concentration camps where they were exterminated, where they were murdered. So this guy, never linking it, can't even go out of his house. He can't go on a vacation. He can't even go to a new restaurant because he be, or he'll have a panic attack. He'll black out. And when I w worked with him, I said, tell me about this blacking out. And he says, I, 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 I feel like I'm going to die if I go anywhere, if I leave my house which was true for everyone in his family back in Poland uh, because they were, they literally were taken out of their houses and they died. So moving can be a trigger. And I'll give you another one. We can get rejected by our partner and, um, be, and we're miserable and uh, the grief is insurmountable. You know, we could even be with this partner for three months and we can say, oh, I don't want to live. I, I'm, I, I want to die. And it's taking us to a much earlier trauma, most likely to a break in the bond, a break in the attachment with our mom when we were an infant, where we did want to die without, actually, we needed our mom to survive. And if she physically or emotionally wasn't there for us, the grief back then, which we've often snuffed out, we've often suppressed it, um, gets pushed down and then it reappears when we get broken up with by a partner. So that's something we have to look at. I'll give you one more. Um, you know, we can have a child. That's another trigger. And then it's as though this ancestral alarm clock. And I, you know, um, I'm going to say those words again, again because it's true. There's like an ancestral alarm clock that starts ringing inside us. When one of these events happens, I once worked with this woman. She was consumed with anxiety, Dr. Michael, as soon as she became pregnant. And so she's in my office, and I'm saying, whoa, 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 let's slow it down. Um, tell me about this anxiety. And she goes, I feel it all the time. I feel it all the time. And I said, when did it start? And she said, I, I don't know, seven, seven months ago. And I said, well, wait a minute, what happened seven months ago? She said, that's when I became pregnant. And I asked one of those questions I ask in my book, you know, I ask the reader, I take the reader on a trip and to become a detective of inherited family trauma through their trauma language. So one of the questions I ask people is, what's your worst fear? What's the worst thing that could happen to you? So I said to this woman, what's the worst fear of being pregnant, of having a baby? And she instantly said, I'll harm my baby. And I said, well, wait a minute, had you ever harmed a baby? No. Did anyone in your family ever harm a baby? And she was just about to say no. She was, no. oh, wait a minute. And she tells the story. Oh, my God. She's my grandmother. As a young mother, she uh, had an infant sleeping upstairs, but she lit a candle and it caught the curtains on fire. And then the house caught on fire and she couldn't get the baby out. And then she said, the baby died, but we were never allowed to talk about it. Oh. And in that moment, she made the link that she had inherited 
um, her grandmother's terror of the baby dying, of starting this fire. And then once she made the link, we're able to break the pattern. So, you know, I think it's always important that we can cognitively go back and make these links. That's why I wrote the book. I, I mean, I wrote the book for two reasons. One, so I could drum up some um, uh, awareness around inherited family trauma. But two, to help people with unexplained symptoms. I mean, I see myself as the guy with the flashlight running around, shining in on our symptoms and behaviors that we can't explain, and helping people, both clinicians and non-clinicians, recognize the importance of generational trauma and its biological effects on the generations. And so um, I, 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 I'm interested in the mysteries that we live with, Dr. Michael, the unexplained fears, the anxieties that strike suddenly. Uh, the depression we never get to the bottom of, the, the chronic uh, or persistent symptoms, the complex illness cases that I work with, Lyme and uh, mold and mast cell activation and cell danger response. You know, these are the cases that, that are difficult to treat in the sense that they're um, always operating behind the surface. And sometimes we've got to peel back and look at either our early history when we were an infant or a child or a baby, or we need to peel back the curtain further and look at what happened to our parents or our grandparents. I love that. Let's take a quick break because I, I want to ask more about that because that's such a, an important aspect. And take a quick break. You're listening to Health Made Radio. I'm here with Mark Willen. He is the best-selling author of It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health Made Radio. I'm Dr. Michael Carlsfeld. I'm here with Mark Willen. He is the author of It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. So you, you were bringing up before the break, you were bringing up things like Lyme, like mold, you know, the, uh, where, where the immune system gets uh, oversensitive. I mean, we have these mast cell activation. You know, people get pain, get headache, get fatigue, get rashes all over, or, you know, I mean, all these different things. So you're saying then that in addition to the pathogen in itself, you know, whether it's Borrelia, parasite, mold, or you know, some retrovirus or whatever it is, we need to look then at inherited family trauma as well to, to unravel that. Absolutely. So, I, I, again, I love how you explained it. Yes, there is the pathogen. There's a physical level. Absolutely, for sure, 100%. But, it's, but we are multi-layered and healing is multidimensional. Um, so, what, oh, gosh, I could explain this in so many ways. Um, one way is let's say we've inherited the biological residue of our parents and our grandparents' traumas, their stress response uh, from a traumatic event, a traumatic event they experienced. Um, so now we've inherited not just this stress response, but we've inherited a system to deal with it, a, um, uh, an altered brain, an overactive amygdala, an overactive stress response. This can create in our body unconscious chronic tightening in the body um, uh, as a defense to, pre to protect us from this trauma. Um, we can create uh, thought, thoughts, behaviors, avoidance techniques, defenses, um, because we're terrified physiologically and even emotionally, of repeating or dealing with this trauma that we're prepared to deal with. Now, with this chronic tightening in our body, this unconscious tightening, because let's say part of that stress response is tightening, numbing, defending to feel safe. After a while, this unconscious tightening can lead to a chronic holding pattern, and that can begin to limit blood flow circulation, oxygen, uh, in those areas that we're trying to protect or feelings we're trying to avoid. After a while, we can even become hypoxic in these areas. 
and suffer from chronic pain or develop disease process in these parts of our bodies. So it's very important that we, we work with what's underneath these, these unconscious strategies, these unconscious, unconscious defenses, these unconscious, this unconscious tightening, this stress response, the stress response that we've either inherited or got re-engineered in our childhood where there was trauma. Because I know also, I mean, let's say when, when we're holding certain emotions, you know, certain emotions tend to be drawn to uh, certain areas of the body, like anger, you know, we know that tends to be stored more in the liver and fear more in the... Uh, the kidneys and things like loneliness, you know, more in the thyroid. And so you, what, what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, when you have then a trauma, uh, then you, you actually, uh, it's, it's like the circulation in that area that gets kind of traumatized and we shut down uh, the circulation, you know, toxins start to build up in that area and then oxygen is decreased into that area, nutrient transport to that area is decreased. So then we have a dysfunctional uh, system or dysfunctional organ uh, due to the trauma. And by releasing the trauma, we are then uh, increasing then the, the flow of, of nutrients and oxygens and, and the, the flow of toxins getting out of there so the tissue can heal. Very well put. Very well put. So when we have a stress response, that stress response, just like we're, we're in, right as we're saying in this conversation, has a physiologic effect. We're unconsciously tight in our abdomen and the organs within, or we feel uh, guarded in our chest and our heart area, and we can even feel the muscles and the fascia guarding our heart and moving inwards, almost blocking us from being hurt. Or we tighten in our throat and don't speak up, and we tighten in our pelvic floor and tighten in our belly. Um, so when I work with people, I look at it as where we fragmented in the trauma or inherited these fragment fragmentations, we need to integrate for the very reasons that you brought up. So we can have increased nutrient flow, increased circulation, increased oxygen flow. So we can live unguarded, vulnerable, open, free. Our, our, and, and then when our doctors prescribe uh, herbs or supplements or medication, our body can receive it because we're flowing and open. Absolutely. That's, that's incredible. And, uh, and then we come also to the issues of things like you know, methylation and mitochondrial activity. And I know that you know, that is something that gets inherited. So if we have trauma from like the mother's side versus father's side, then, uh, and I, I believe that methylation, you know, if it's from the father's side, then that can then impact how we methylate, which has a huge amount to do with how we detoxify and produce neurotransmitters, uh, hormones, and all these kind of things. And then obviously the mitochondria from the mother's side, uh, that's how we repair uh, our tissue. That's how we regulate uh, whether a cell should die or not, you know, for like cancer. You know, if the mitochondria is not functioning appropriately, then you know, the, 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 that's more prone to then become cancerous. So that can actually be then a, a trauma from the mother uh, that you're more prone to cancer. Uh, absolutely, exactly. Well, exactly. So w this is taking us into an important part of the discussion. How do we heal? <laughs> and I think, yeah. and, and what we're talking about here is, you know, so we can have improved neurotransmitters, improved hormonal flow. Um, look, there's so much positive research happening right now. Um, researchers are now able to reverse trauma symptoms in mice that have been traumatized in labs. And they, they study mice because mice and humans are very similar um, genetically. You know, 90% of the genes in humans um, uh, have counterparts in mice. I mean, uh, over 90% 
of the genes in humans has counterparts in mice. Over 80% are identical. Um, so what they're showing is when traumatized mice are exposed to positive experiences, it changes the way the DNA expresses. Technically, it inhibits the enzymes that, that affect DNA, methyl, DNA methylation and histone modifications, which are two, as we just talked about, two of the mechanisms of transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. So we can literally change the way our DNA expresses, and then we can change the way it's transmitted to the next generation. Um, for example, when they've done these studies on mice, the epigenetic signature is, is changed that passes down through the sperm to future generations. Um, so just in terms of how we heal, we've got to change our brain. We've got to have positive experiences that can change our brain. And then we need to practice the new feelings and the new sensations associated with these positive experiences. When we do this, we not only create new neural pathways, but we also stimulate the release of feel-good neurotransmitters like uh, serotonin, dopamine, uh, GABA. Uh, also, we stimulate the release of feel-good hormones like estrogen and oxytocin. Even the genes involved in the body stress response can begin to function in, a, in an improved way. Again, we can change the way our DNA expresses. This is what all the new science is leading us toward. So these positive experiences can be practices of receiving comfort uh, or support. Remember, I talked about Sarah. Whenever she would go to cut, she felt her grandparents with her. In, she felt... Uh, as though they were, they were both dead, but she had a visualization, an inner image that they were there with her, and that helped her stop cutting. These positive experiences can be um, feelings of compassion, gratitude, uh, generosity, loving kindness. Again, practicing feelings of comfort, support, practicing mindfulness, ultimately anything that allows us to feel strength or peace or joy inside because these types of experiences feed the prefrontal cortex and can help us reframe the stress response so it has a chance to downregulate. So our brain can literally calm down. The idea is to pull traction away from the limbic system, the overactive amygdala, and bring engagement to the, to the forebrain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, where we can integrate these new positive experiences and our brains can change. We know from the mindfulness studies that are out there that practicing mindfulness actually shrinks the amygdala and thickens the prefrontal cortex. So basically, uh, if I put it in a nutshell, we've got to practice being with what's uncomfortable in our body, being with the uncomfortable sensations in our body, the tightening, the shutting down, the, the, the way our body hurts, until we can reach what's beneath that, the sensations we experience as, as life-giving, sensations like pulsing, tingling, softening, expanding, blood flowing, waves of energy, waves of warmth, feeling our warm belly, you know, feeling blood flowing in our heart, you know, feeling our lungs taking in air. And then we need to be able to hold these positive sensations for at least a minute, at least a minute, Dr. Michael, and do this six times a day. That can be enough to change our brain and, and calm our stress response. Well, it's amazing. I, would, I mean, and, and that's what I loved about your book. You know, it's such a powerful book. And, it really um, it, it, it was, it was a guide how to first to kind of recognize what inherited traumas are and so we can recognize that within ourselves and also uh, seeing how you can then create this, this genealogical map you know, where you can, uh, can put the, the different, your, your father, grandfather, mother, so forth, and, and the different traumatic events that took place and then seeing how they can impact you and then also the different exercises that you wrote down 
where you can then connect again with your father, with your mother, and, and really analyze where things are, uh, aren't where they should be, and then what you can do to, to fix it. I mean, so it was, it was such a, uh, it, was, it was a delight to read, and, and it was such a practical book, you know, to, to kind of look at yourself to resolve these different things. Thank you. That's such a good description of the book. Literally, uh, you know, just like you said in the first part of the book, I teach people how to be detectives of their family trauma. I teach them how to look at their own trauma language. And then in the second part of the book, just like you said, I have people draw a map and uh, start to connect these traumas to the events in the previous generations or, or in our early um, childhood uh, maybe our attachment with our mom, because that's equally important. And then in the third part of the book, I teach us how to have positive experiences so that we can change our brain. So that's, thank you. That's a, such a good read of my book. I'm, I'm honored. Well, well thank you. Yeah, it, was, it was a fascinating book, and yeah, it's, it's something that uh, an, an individual is doing a disservice to themselves not to read and practice what's in it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I would like to close with just with one one point, and, and I, I just think that this is such an important point, and that is it, for mothers that are wanting to become pregnant, how important is it for them to go through this type of work so that they are in a happy and emotional good space when they're carrying a child? Yeah, yeah, you bring up a really important topic. I'm a proponent of, you know, women being able to take a year or two off from work, which we don't have in our country. I think it's, what, six months, three months, whatever it is, it's not enough. And then to feel supported by their family, supported by their husbands or their partners. I mean, it's so important that we have, um, uh, that we can raise babies with healthy attachments, um, so I'm glad that we just brought light to that. And then if we can, knowing that we're going to get pregnant, uh, e on either side of the equation, we're going to impregnate or be pregnant, it's very important to do our own personal work. You know, um, we need to shake the family tree in a way and see what falls out. What family secrets um, have been hidden? What stories didn't get told? What traumas never healed all the way? And then we've got to do our personal work um, because that's, um, I found that if we I ignore the past, it comes back to haunt us. But if we explore it, we don't have to repeat it. We can break the destructive patterns and then our children can be born in a more hospitable, um, more gentle environment because we're more gentle. We're more open. We're more free. Our bodies are more fluid. So, yeah, thank you for that question. And, and I, I know in your book you were talking about that, you know, babies are exposed to increased cortisol in utero, so if the mother is under stress, um, and as early as 17 weeks after the concep conception, they were showing then impaired cognitive development because of this exposure to the extra cortisol. You know, I thought that was fascinating. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, there are so many early events that can affect us. Um, now, you know, I want to end on a positive note by saying that we can heal. We can change our brain. And then I want to say what happens when we're in the womb. Events in utero um, are very important. Did a baby die before us? Did mom have a miscarriage or a stillborn beforehand? And did she think we might not live either? and she was excreting cortisol, and that cortisol is caustic to a baby? What, was our mom not going to keep us for a while? Um, uh, did our mom not keep us? And all through the pregnancy are the words, I can't keep you, I can't keep you. Were our parents fighting or drinking or cheating or separating? Was, was either parent an alcoholic? Was mom not feeling supported? Did she not love our father? Did she feel trapped? Did dad not love her? Was she worried about money, shelter, food? You know, there's so many things that all translate into cortisol, which is caustic to the fetus. In fact, babies even develop a cortisol-busting enzyme to deal with mom's cortisol. So 
Uh, look, what we know from embryo, uh, uh, the study of embryology, that when a baby is 20 weeks in utero, the heart is developed and the beginning of the nervous system, the, nerve, the neural tube and the neural groove, all present in the fetus at 20 days. And so there are somatic memories, even though there are cognitive memories. So that's why I'm a proponent of moms, if you're going to have babies, um, wait until, you know, your marriage is working out and, you know, you're, you've got a level playing field here to, to raise that baby. Yeah, I love that. Well, uh, Mark, it, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, and I'm so grateful for the work you're doing. It, uh, it is so, so crucial, and uh, I'm really hoping that all the listeners get your book, uh, It Didn't Start With You, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle, and, uh, and start working on themselves. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, it's, it's, it's so important. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Michael. What a pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you. That is it for today. You're listening to Health Made Radio. Remember, check us out at healthmade.co. Health is what you make it. <laughs>